Welcome, welcome everybody to this uh, BVC in action, Barrett Value Center in action, meaning um, sessions that we have on a regular basis talking about stories of uh, experiences from uh, practitioners around the world. This one is going to be somewhat different. It's called the six cultural enablers to navigate COVID and beyond. Um, will be a little bit different in, in context uh, because at, uh, what we are going to share with you is, is more about what are the values and the needs that we have uh, captured during this time of uh, difficulty and, and difference, I would say, that we are currently in when it comes to the COVID uh, pandemic going on, so to speak. And it has not really decreased. It's actually taking on as well as we speak. So what we are going to talk about is probably going to be even more relevant in, in the near future as well. But it's helping us, hopefully, uh, our intention with this uh, webinar is to share the collective wisdom of uh, what is being the voice of the world that has been researched. We did a seminar and a research in May uh, this year, the um, global COVID-19 country assessment. And we used that material to uh, create a, a co-created dialogue with people to talk about what could we actually learn from that and what can we move, how can we actually do something about this uh, moving forward and learning. And our intention today is to, to make this vis wisdom of the crowd that we have um, collected, so to speak, it's not our wisdom and it's not the answer, it's the collective wisdom of the crowd that has participated in the journey to work with this result and uh, create something that speaks in more concrete language. What can we do about it? How, what's expected to get the most out of this situation and how could you lead people through this? Um, and please know that this is only an introduction and you will get a lot of uh, material afterwards. You will get the whole full report of the conclusions that came out of this. Also, all the uh, recording of the whole session and the slides will be there. Um, and also the Q&A. Uh, when it comes to the Q&A, you will have questions. Please write them into the Q&A box, which you find at the bottom of your screen, most likely, or hopefully, uh, as you speak. Uh, because we will have, to start with, a presentation uh, where we go through the things. And then we'll get back and have Q&As at the end where we can have more of a co-creative conversation. We will also have a poll during the presentation to get a little bit more understanding of what's, uh, how do you relate to what we are talking about. Um, anything that I feel that you feel that I missed uh, so far, Phil? I, I, I was trying to build on what you're saying. So what, what we're sharing today is not a manual for how leaders have to be. This is more about capturing the emerging energy, the new consciousness that's, that's coming. And the, this is much more about inspiration and exploration so that, so that people can figure this out for themselves rather than saying you have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. So um, that's really what we wanted to share. And I, I just want to remind people again, there's two areas for, for you to kind of type in. One is the chat box, which many of you have already used for putting your name in and where in the world you are. The other is the Q&A area. Um, and so if you have a question that we're going to handle the last 15 to 20 minutes of this session is questions. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A area, not in the chat box, because we'll be curating all your questions from the Q&A. So just a quick reminder there. Yeah. Thank you. And then if to add then, what is to be expected? And we will talk about how did we reach where we are today, the material, what was the journey that has been taken? We'll talk about that. And we also talk about the conclusion that came out of uh, that journey uh, and giving you a, some, I would call it the framework or a, a language to be able to address this as a leader or as an organization. Um, and then uh, we will also give you some support material, tips and tricks for how you can actually go from here. That will be uh, what we hope uh, to get before we get into the Q&A. With that, I think that we kick it off. And uh, why don't you, uh, Phil, uh, start with introducing uh, the whole session? Of course. And um, so what, what we're going to be sharing with you is, a, is an energy of the new leaders for today. And I think it's really important to recognize that nobody's perfect. Like I, I'm actually, uh, there's a picture here and a quote of Jacinda Ardern, who is a 
in my view, quite a remarkable leader who's making a big difference in her country and on the global scale. And for me, this quote and her energy right now is very reflective of what we're about to share with you. Is she perfect? Has she got everything right? Absolutely not. But that's also part of what we're about to share, that the, the humility to like, work from the heart, but also recognize that we're all work in progress as well. And um, so during today's session, there's quite a big cast. You've already seen them on the screen. And, and we don't have time to do personal introductions to everybody. Um, but what you see here is a photograph of um, a screen capture of, of a working session we had a few months ago uh, where we were working on this. And so, uh, of course, Tor and I will be hosting. Unfortunately, Joe isn't with us today. He's, he's, uh, he's unwell. Uh, but my Daniel colleague, uh, uh, my my colleague Daniel is here instead, looking after the chat box. And then we have uh, Jean and Isabel from Sakatan and Joanne and Anne from Synthetron. And so I thank them all for their kind of everything they've given to make this possible. This has all been done um, voluntarily and with lots of love and care. Thank you, Phil. Uh Isabel, if you could uh, come online and uh, share us a little bit about the intention of this work that we have been doing. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Phil. I mean, first of all, I'm, uh, I'm really, um, I feel emotion uh, being with you uh, today. Uh, we are about 170 uh, around this virtual uh, webinar. Um, and I want to share what was our intention. Uh, you know, when we had to suddenly change our life, we were locked uh, at home. And our intention together with the team was to measure uh, the impact of this great pause. Um, unfortunately, we may well have to add an S to that and to use it uh, with plural because in some countries, new lockdown will be organized. Uh, so we wanted to understand what was happening uh, what did we learn? What did we do differently? And to capture that unique moment we all go uh, through. Um, and for that, we have used a very simple journey, very simple methodology, which is based in three major steps. The first one is choosing the words. And here, uh, this is when we, we, we called Phil and Thor and say, okay, how can we rebound on this cultural assessment? You know, which is what are the values during the COVID and post COVID? Uh, so that's meaning of the words, choosing the words, sorry. Then the second step is meaning of the words. Uh, we, we invited a lot of participants uh, into a dialogue, um, trying to understand what was the meaning of these values. And we co-created the session uh, online. And we ask a question, you know, what does it mean to you? What does it mean for the society? What will it change in the world? What do we do, for example, when we are autonomous or when we care? Uh, so here we invited people to understand more about the meaning of the values for during the COVID and post-COVID period. And then the third uh, step was uh, leaving the words. Now we have a common dictionary. Uh, how can we bring life to this and how can we make it sustainable for, for the future? And here we, co, uh, we have co-written uh, a report together with 160 participants uh, and developed tools that you will, you will see today that will be uh, presented. So it was choosing the words, meaning of the words, living the words, three steps. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. So let's go back a little bit and, and just to refresh our memory regarding the global uh, measurement, Phil. Would you take us through that, please? Yeah, of course. And I would imagine that many of the people on the call here today were also part of the big webinar we held in May, which was really um, six weeks after the World Health Organization launched the pandemic, or didn't they launch the, they, they announced it as a pandemic. We ran a values assessment uh, to find out what was happening in the world. What was the, what was the values-based response to this? And if, so if you go to the next one, then you'll, you'll see that we had uh, a sample from all over the world, different, different levels of seniority, uh, different regions, different generations, and also looking at key data like are, are these key workers, are people working from home, gender, et cetera. Uh, and so we ran that during April and May. And uh, let me just introduce you to two or three of the results. Um, 
So the first thing is that we saw a transformation at, at, at an organizational level that would typically take between five and seven years. It happened in just six weeks. It was a remarkable shift of priorities. And I would say a transformation of consciousness in both leadership and organizational culture. And that would be characterized by these two things. One is there was a, a shift in personal values. So we compared what was happening at that moment during kind of six weeks after the, the big COVID pandemic was announced and to, to what would be the major picture of personal values in the year before that. And we saw that these things had emerged. So making a difference, adaptability, um, well-being and caring. So looking after ourselves, looking after others, adapting to life conditions and, 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 and actually showing up to make a difference for others. And what was interesting is that continuous learning and family also jumped to the top of the list. From an organizational standpoint, the keys that we saw here was that we had shifted like almost globally from, from 150 years of industrial age thinking of performance control and hierarchy. So I'm the boss and I'm going to tell you what to do to a new style of leadership and a new style of organization where this was about, this was about people, this was about adaptability and was working together. And so it was much more about listening to and caring for people and, and finding a way through this together. Thank you, Phil. Let's then uh, listen to what happened afterwards and, and the e-dialogue and how we reach the meaning of the words. Uh, Joanne, would you be willing to come on? Thank you. Uh, you're muted, so if you unmute, then it becomes... There we go. Okay. Hello, everyone. And we invited um, the people who participated in the survey. We invited our clients, social yeah, and 160 people joined the e-dialogue. They came from 50 countries and they were extremely productive. If you see there, voted uh, almost 20, 17,000 times. They actually joined what we call a Sintertron dialogue and they um, shared ideas in this synchronous way of all together where they were sharing ideas, voting on each other, ideas and finding out amongst themselves the best ideas. This uh, was anonymous, this was written, and we got the result of 600 what we call Sintertron's ideas that got traction that were actually giving also a certain number of votes. Uh, these discussions are also moderated and how we moderated them is actually seen in this uh, next slide because you need powerful questions to moderate them. The questions in detail and all the sub-questions we, we use to trigger the conversation further are in the report for you, so you will have them. But just to tell you how we manage the flow of the discussion, the first question was actually asking the people to say, you know, what did you learn? What was positive? What happened? And it was a warm-up question to, to share and reflect on what was positive actually out of uh, the experience that people had. And then we bounced back on what uh, Phil introduced earlier earlier and say, well, the caring to heal uh, is something that people want more of. What does it mean? What does it take to be caring and healing for organizations, for society, for leaders? What, what do we see then? What want to see? Um, the third topic was actually about this capacity to rebound, agility and adaptability. We want, and it's clear that we were new values. But how confident are we that we're going to make it? And what gives us confidence? The nice thing is on the closed question, how confident, 80% say that they were confident to somewhat confident. So that was a very positive mood there. But it was also very interesting to find out what brings that confidence and what is it uh, that triggers it and that supports it. Next to all this in change, there was this question, but what is change? about what do we leave behind and there were all more ideas of we learned and things happened that we don't want to return back so what is the big let go what do we have to stop doing what do we have to let go and never do again and finally the question to the participants was um, if you look at all this um, 
what is it that we expect to leaders? What we expect them to do differently? What uh, are the things we ask them to stop or to start or to do more often? Now, these were then analyzed because the results of this were this uh, 600 synthetrons, which are ideas that got traction, that get actually a number next to it, like 25 people kind of promoted it further or 10 or 50. And we then did our classical analysis, question by question, what is coming out, what are the topics, and cluster them together, find out how important that is. And when we took a step back and said, well, there's something else here. If you go through all the five questions, not horizontally, question by question, but vertically, you discover that there's something systemic going on. Whether you ask it's about learning or leaders or agility or let go, there were actually six teams that systemically came back. And that were actually true values that we discovered. And these will be explained to you by my colleagues. Thank you, Duan. Uh, unfortunately, you break up a little bit, so... The, but I hope that ah. we, we got the message clear as, as much as it was possible. Thank you, Joanne. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, John into this next one, meaning living the words. Uh, what was the conclusion? What was the, um, these different six different areas, John? Yes, there are a number of areas that we've identified uh, reading and analyzing the conversation that has taken place. But what I wanted to start with is that we were really confronted with an unprecedented lockdown. And what that does mean, that means that we had no history we could refer to. We had no statistics on how to resolve it. We had, we individuals and we organizations, we had to invent a new way. We had to understand and we had to experiment with all what it means in terms of ways of working. We, were, we had to come from that vision of developing reliable forecasts into a, uh, a vision of uncertainty, uh, not knowing what would be the, uh, the result and what would be the next step. That requires uh, leaders with a different mindset, with a, with a different preparation, uh, not leaders that are ready to uh, to, to design or to represent the future, but leaders that, are, uh, that, that have a vision and that, that allow creativity and innovation to take place um, and allowing the mistakes that go together with it. Uh, so people have to still feel good uh, when they make mistakes. Uh, that maybe some of you would be surprised that we've been brainwashed at school that uh, a mistake is a bad thing and we, we've taken an <coughs> a grade off for that. Um, speed uh, was, was the essence and we had a psychological pressure which was huge uh, on our shoulders. Every day we, we got new numbers of uh, uh, death and, uh, <coughs> and of uh, um, things, the urgency of, uh, of things. Uh, the scale as well was so, so huge that we had to learn to work across boundaries. Uh, we, <clears throat> we were not uh, any longer contemplating boundaries as divisions, but as uh, places where people can join and stick together. Uh, moving from uh, good to great leaders was the first step. Now we're moving from um, great leaders to heroic leaders. Heroic leaders, they, these are people who are human and human in the sense that they, uh, they value people. <clears throat> they, leaders that uh, bring their organization at a stage where they become role models. Uh, organizations that are exemplary, uh, that, that make their organizations exemplary to, uh, to, to, to anybody. Uh, empathetic leaders, uh, who uh, create that, that safe space that, where people can express themselves and understand they are being listened to and that they are being heard. Uh, courageous as well. Uh, a lo lot of courage has to be <clears throat> brought together to let go uh, the, the traditional command and control. 
the the necessity and the ability to <clears throat> not to be prepared. Um, organizations have to become learning uh, communities where, where personal development is encouraged. Uh, innovation accelerate in the sense that innovation will accelerate change and bring resilience. And if I put that in the right order, that's a human, empathetic, role model, open, innovative, and courageous. So that's, these are the few words that I, I wanted to share with you. Yeah, these are the six themes that has emerged from, from this uh, whole e-dialogue conversation and has been that we have then organized. So thank you, John. I'd like to invite Anna uh, into the next step, more of what is this, uh, if we then conceptualize this, Anna, what would you, how would you describe that? Okay, um, if I could have the next slide. So what also became clear in analyzing the data from our conversation is that the changes necessary to create an heroic organization begin at the level of the individual and radiate out to the organizational level We've tried to illustrate this with the donut shaped diagram you see on the slide. The three cultural values in the inner circle, open, human, empathetic, represent the areas where the respondents saw positive personal transformations during the COVID crisis in the spring. We became more human, that is vulnerable, humble, authentic. We understood the need for empathy and learned to listen more carefully to each other and demonstrate understanding. And faced with new challenges, we quickly saw the need to create an open learning environment where we encourage each other to learn new skills. The three cultural values on the outer circle, acting as a role model, being courageous, being innovative, represent the organizational aspirations made possible by the personal transformations. And if I could have the next slide, uh, which should make this clearer. Um, I'm going to go into detail on one of the sections that's open to innovative. As you'll see, open is more about creating room for personal growth. Innovative builds on this open environment to encourage creativity at an organizational level. So starting with open, open learning organizations enabled the emergence of motivated communities where members coach each other as well as transforming and developing themselves. The value of the newfound openness to learning caused by the COVID shutdown was not lost on our 160 participants. They clearly saw the value of an open learning environment going forward. The three main uh, themes that emerged were, uh, firstly, ask rather than tell. An ask rather than tell style enables meaningful dialogue supporting self-development. Our participants talked about such things as coaching others with love, interest in growth and development, and a coaching culture. Another theme was creating a learning community. Learning organizations establish feedback, a feedback culture and have a great capacity to share knowledge at all levels of the organization. In the words of the participants, so many people were trying to share knowledge with each other to help each other grow and adapt. A final theme that was open was that open learning organizations encourage personal development. They invest in self-awareness and self-improvement. These are the pillars of collective awareness that organizations, sorry, these are the pillars of collective awareness that organizations do not transform, people do. To quote one of our respondents, organizations only transform when the leaders have transformed themselves. Whereas open is focused on personal development, innovative is more, I'm back at the, yeah. Uh, innovative is more about the organizations as a whole. Innovative organizations are agile and adaptive. They understand that technology enables proximity and even physical distance. Human interconnectedness can accelerate change and, and promote innovation. According to our respondents, innovative organizations, first of all, accelerate change. Uh, they embrace the idea that change is constant and can be fun. Secondly, innovation, 
innovative organizations foster connectivity. They develop new ways of collaboration based on human and digital interconnectedness. The responses from our participants show that virtual relationships are appreciated more than ever, and that it seems that geographical borders have faded or become less important. In their own words, they discovered how to create magic digitally. Finally, innovative organizations applaud resilience and the creativity it engenders. During the spring, organizations found themselves suddenly confronted with a blank page on which they needed to draw new ways forward. This unleashed limitless creativity and allowed them to adapt and transform. Our participants want this resilience to be maintained. Mm. And now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, obviously our time today is too short to go into all six cultural enablers. You can learn more by reading a report. And this is just an, a picture of one of the pages of the report on open organizations. Uh, each theme is laid out with actual quotes from the respondents. And there's also a graph which shows the relative importance of the themes for the respondents. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Um, let's move on then. Uh, now I think that uh, I would like to invite Phil. We would like to, and you are muted now, Phil, so you see that. Um, we would like to ask you, and, and, and just with a, the possibility for you to overlook, since we don't have time to go through in such a detail of the whole result, we will have uh, an image uh, that actually describes high level, the different perspectives, and you can read this. And uh, while you do so, we are going to, uh, for in a little while, we're going to have a pool where you are going to be asked how much you feel that your organization, where you are operating today, currently are living this, not at all, all the way to all the time. But we'll, let's look at this for a little while silently uh, and read that out. Phil, would you like to add anything? Yeah, to it's maybe a little unfair to ask this question when we haven't really gone into the detail of all of these and you'll get all the detail after it. But we're going to ask the question anyway, just to get a yeah. feeling. Um, and and so just take 20 seconds just to read this and then we'll, we'll put the poll up, uh, which is going to ask how heroic is your organization? I think you can move the box around your screen so you can probably see both. I'm going to launch the poll and we'll just take like 20 seconds or so because uh, just go with, a, go with a gut feel rather than the right answer. And I guess that you can see the poll on my screen then on the side now so that you can still read it. Is that correct, Phil? I can see the results coming in and and in it is coming on my screen as well. Yeah, so but I don't know if you see that on 100, your 100 and so we've got a we've got 73% of people have voted already. I'm going to leave it for another 5 or 10 seconds and then I'll be able to share the results. Okay, 5 4 3 2 1 and polling, and I'm going to share the results. So what we see here is that um, the biggest number shows in a lot, and which, which means that actually most people feel that they're working. Not, no, not most people. 33% of people feel they're working. Exactly. In, yeah, sorry. 33% of people feel they're working in organizations that, that really reflect this. And, and actually 19%, very much so. They're fully fully on board with this. That's um, to celebrate. That really is to celebrate. And mm -hmm. in fact, one of the interesting things is that the very much so, um, we realize that, that part of being heroic is being vulnerable and, and having humility to know that we're not we're not fully done yet. We're not perfect. And so very much so also includes the possibility that we've still got some development to do as well. And, and there are some people in the organization or, or on the call today who were feeling 4% of feeling not at all. And uh, so the celebration there is huge opportunity for development and, uh, and possibility there. What, what more would you add to that, Tor? No, I think that's a good summary. And I'm looking at time so that we have time for questions as well. Uh, and, and, and yeah, 
so let's let's uh, if you take that down uh, yeah. uh, i hope that you were able to see that uh, it looks like i was looking at the chat box that some were not able to see but i hope that most people were able to see this yeah but it was i'm happy to see that there is uh, room for improvement let's put it like that and this is hopefully then going to be something that you can act upon which comes to the the next stage of this which is really living the words uh, tools uh, if you will and um I think uh, Joanne uh, was, no, that's not, this is Isabella, you were the one, yeah, you were the one yes. who was going to talk about this one. <laughs> yes, I'm the one. You want me to have the next picture? Yes, thank you, Phil. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm impressed, actually, I'm quite happy that we have about 50% of you who feel that they do live in a heroic organization. Um, to, to, to make it further heroic or more heroic, or for those who are not, who do not feel that they live in a heroic organization, um, together with the team, we have put some tools um, to engage actually a dialogue internally. Um, for that, of course, you, have the, you will get the full report explaining all the dimension, you know, what is the new meaning of, uh, it's a new meaning of a hero, actually. It's not a hero with big muscles, strong man or strong woman, you know, who knows it all. It's a vulnerable per person um, being able to, 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 to pose, to listen and to connect uh, with the environment and with uh, the, the teams. You can use as well uh, the script. Joanne has uh, uh, introduced that to you. And it's a very valuable script. And it's still, you can still use it because we, we do that in some virtual workshop. And uh, teams like to work on that. You know, what did we learn? Uh, so this is a real tool. So you can have a dialogue about heroic among your organization. And there's as well a self-assessment. A uh, very simple one, um, and you can give that to some team members. You can do it yourself, uh, and you have some questions. You give the answers, and you will see at the end where, where you stand uh, in terms of uh, heroic uh, attitude. Um, so enjoy, enjoy the tools to, um, to help uh, leaders, to help yourself, to help your team, and to help your companies uh, going through this uh, uh, COVID-19 um, pandemic. Thank you. Isabel, I think Thank that uh, here you have a possibility to really kickstart your conversation. And as we all know, that the transformation happens when you start to talk about it and, and share your views and so on. So hopefully this will be possible for you to see where you have your strength, as many have said that they do, but also to see where you have your areas of improvement uh, and lead you into a conversation to next. Phil, you would like yeah, to say something. Yeah, I'm going to actually answer one of the questions from Gail. Are you giving us permission to use these tools in our own work and actually uh, the answer is is a yes and I, what i wanted to say was i want to say thank you to all of the team for their generosity for their sense of service and making a difference for making all of this available without charge and so yes gail this is this is available for you to pick up and use and adapt and, and if you find better ways to do it, please share it back with the community because we, we've just been building on the results of the values assessment, the e-dialogue with all these people and now and now creating this. So this really is in the spirit of, of goodwill to put this out there so that others can explore. So I'll continue with this. Um, just to remind you all that uh, that actually this is this is the work that we're in. That many of you on this call I know are already certified in these models and tools, the Barrett models and tools, and we see that uh, not only the cultural values assessment, which is a way of understanding the dynamics in the organisation, but particularly our leadership tools, our 360 leadership tools, and self a new self assessment in there. These are vital. Uh, reflection and self-reflection instruments to help leaders really take these steps with this with this new heroic uh, front. And in order to kind of get some perspective of what this is, this really we don't claim, as we as Phil was saying earlier, that this is the answer or this is the uh, the the whole picture. That you, what I would like to say is that there are so many other organizations and well-known organizations, PricewaterhouseCoopers and Harvard Business Review and McKinsey and the like are writing about this, doing research at the same time. And there's a lot of evidence showing the same type of request or a need uh, of organizations and leaders. Uh, so it's, we just 
post a few of these things, which I think you have seen, and I can see on Phil that he has some. I do want to say something add. because not only not only has there been a shift of consciousness in what these reports are reporting, there's actually been a shift of consciousness in the reporting itself to see McKinsey um, and and Harvard Business Review expressing some of these things in the way they're doing it has been amazing to me. It, um, so it, there, is a, there is a new uh, energy of consciousness and leadership that's emerging. And this, th uh, these heroic factors are not just coming from us. There is definitely an energy that's pervading. Mm. And we all know, and we are very well aware of that this is not something that is over, far from it. And we would like no. to continue the journey. And uh, there is a uh, next step, I'm trying to get that here. Uh, we would, and Joanne, would you be willing to speak to this one, uh, please? Let's see if she is not present there. Oops. But, here yeah, we go. Here okay. Um, thank you. Yes, indeed. Um, we, the first time when we did this uh, e dialogue, we were in. June, early June, and meanwhile we're in in autumn, and expectations are different, experiences are different, and we think there's a lot of knowledge, but also good practices, tips to share, pitfalls to 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 warn people for, and so we invite again everyone to participate in an e dialogue. You have the link there, uh, a Bitly. If you don't find it, go to the website of Sintotron. You'll find it, or or you. you it's get also. In the chat box at the moment. We have it already displayed the, in the chat box. Thank you, Dan. And it will be, again, a one-hour conversation. Uh, I really hope that many of you can join to co-create this way forward and find out that what in four months' time has changed, what are the things that we can learn from each other to actually get stronger and stronger and better in being rebounding and resilient and heroic in one way or another. And there's room for everyone. I think you have room for up to a thousand people in that. So Holy just join. So, uh, and even if we, if we would have 2,000 people, we facilitate 2,000 people in our yeah. discussion. No problem. Um, yeah. And you will see it's an enjoying experience. So uh, yeah. you learn from it and you'll enjoy it. Thank you. So let's then move into... Um, uh, the questions. I haven't really followed uh, how many questions we have. It looks like we I'll have. I'll start 10, with that. 10. And so, Tori, if you stop sharing your screen and we ask all of our panelists yep. to come online. So, um, Joanna, thank you very much. Good to see all your faces nice and big now. Yes. Um, hello. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to start and tour. Maybe you can catch up as as uh, we usually share some of these things. The first yeah. one's the first one's very simple. It's from Elaine, and oh, you can hear my puppy is now uh, barking in the background. This is part of all the joys of <laughs> what, what it's like to work in a COVID world and not be in the office. But anyway, um, so Elaine asked, uh, "I sorry if I missed this, but are we getting a copy of the slides?" And the answer is an absolute yes. We'll be publishing. Yes the slides the video and the report as well so uh, and i know that daniel has already posted a link to the report and you you should be able to download that right now and get that as we're talking so that one um thank you elaine and i'll say done to that actually i'm going to address this mainly to you tor um yeah so it's from thomas you mean thomas yeah so sweden yeah, thomas, John. Sweden has taken a somewhat different route of actions to deal with the pandemic. It has been criticized in the world, the world around the world. Can these uh, differences in views be explained by cultural differences, do you think? It will be interesting in hearing your thoughts and reflections. So to, I'm going to ask you to start, Tor, but if anybody else has views on that, then welcome to respond. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a different type of question related to what we are, have just presented, I would say, but it's more of a, how we relate to uh, authorities. Um, and uh, also, yeah, I think that's a one thing that's a major difference. We, we follow very much of what's being, being said. Now, I would even go back and say to Thomas, right now, we are not following the recommendation and Sweden is actually having quite severe upturn so i don't know how re relevant it is at this point but i think that's more of a political and and uh, word view perspective uh, which is maybe not related to this at this point i i, I must say so uh, um 
I'm happy to have a conversation with Thomas regarding that. Yeah. But of course, the cultural context that you are in has an impact on how you perceive the result and how you work with it. Good. There is an, in, sorry, an interesting sorry, yeah. question from uh, Benjamin, because Benjamin uh, says he's from uh, France. And actually, in France, you know, a hero is, is a strong leader. And uh, he says, um, I have a question, maybe linked to my French culture, indeed, in France. We have difficulties with a figure of heroic leaders who crushes others. And actually, uh, Benjamin, thank you very much for, for that. I'm, I'm French as well from origin. And... Um, Actually, the, that's what we, we said, the, the new meaning of hero, the hero now is a humble person, uh, is an authentic person, is not, you know, the know-it-all uh, man or woman. And, and here, there was another question from uh, Alistair, who said, have you discovered that the outcome differs from country to country? And actually, I can say to both of you that there, were, there was an alignment from more than 50 countries in the world of, of the new meaning uh, of that, you know, the, the, the leaders of tomorrow and being heroic is first being humble and being vulnerable. I hope it answers your question. I'm not sure. Well, I would also add to that, Alistair, about the differences between uh, country to country. Um, and I don't have it like I couldn't recite to you what the absolute differences are. But when we did the original COVID culture assessment, we, we did take not a country view, but a regional view. So we were to take, able to take North America, South America, Europe, Asia, et cetera. And so you would be able to uh, click on the link that uh, I think Daniel put in earlier into the session, and you can actually go and look at all of the regional results. And I know that we also have um, differences by um, industry as well. And there absolutely were differences by industry. Uh, so we looked at what it was like to before COVID and during COVID in the government sector, for example, what it was like before COVID and during COVID in the mining sector or the technology sector. And there were very much, uh, there, there were really clear messages that were coming from each of those sectors. We need to, we are also going to collect all the comments and make those available because there are some very insightful yes comments coming in in the chat box which we have no way of being able to capture now but we will make sure that that is downloaded so that we are able to follow that very insightful uh, thank you david william gustavo all these are having very good conversations i mean the good news the is that everybody can read the chat box as well so you you can yeah. you can watch live what's happening in there yeah, yeah. so what would we see now, and I also realize we don't have the answers and we are not uh, defending <laughs> and standing up as uh, somebody with all the wisdom. That's not the case. It's our personal view and our experience. What we are presenting is what we have picked out as the collective wisdom of the crowd that has participated in them. Uh, and so I'm realizing that we are to answer some of the more difficult questions as we were the experts, which I don't think that we are, to be honest. Let's see. Um, but I can, take you, a, I can take yeah. another one. So uh, from Linda, and this is to all of us here. And again, uh, knowing that we're not experts, but we can, we can play with it. The second lockdown is starting to feel more anxious. Is it possible this may drive people further down the hierarchy of needs to focus more on security and more defensiveness? Mm -hmm. uh, le what Leaders need to protect against this. What, what are we feeling? What are we seeing? What do we imagine also with this? Well, um, what, what I observe actually, you know, like a lot of people, we have, uh, uh, we have less mission now and our job has reduced about 90%, you know, because we cannot travel around the world. And, uh, uh, but we, we do have the feeling through the contacts we have with our clients or that actually there is really a focus on survival. Uh, and now some companies are closing, closing, closing up again. Um, and, and it's tough because they have to make some people redundant and social plan and all that. So there is a focus on survival, yes, and the stress is increasing. This is mm -hmm. what I feel from our network of clients and, and friends. But yeah. we can ask them. Yeah, and that's part of what's coming out in the uh, e-dialogue that will be taking place in a couple of days as well. That's exactly yeah. what we are trying to capture there. Yeah. 
uh, from a personal perspective, yeah, I think it's very natural and very predictable that that will be the case, that your focus will be to survive uh, when you are threatened. Mm. Mm. I think there's also what, what I've seen is a polarization. Um, we we saw many situations and many stories where leaders stood up and responded in quite remarkable ways, and they uh, they truly listened to their people and they they took on a new level of caring. And we were even asking the question at that point: Well, is this is just a short term reaction, and they'll go back to how it was? And I believe what's happening right now is a, is a polarization of those who have, who have seen a new possibility and are choosing to lead in a different way and those who are really going back to how things were. And there is no doubt in my mind that as the second wave comes, it will, it will introduce new levels of challenge, new levels of stress, new levels of, of fear um, that will test us all actually. And so um, going back to our values and saying, what do I stand for in this moment? And how can I do my best to calm myself and, and be a good leader? And then, so with all of this, it comes back to what's my personal response and how, how can I show up in the best way I can, knowing that we're all human beings and we're not perfect and, and we'll have days where it feels pretty crap. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to say the word crap. <laughs> we, we have a question here from Giovanna, uh, which I think it's an interesting even suggestion, I, I would say. Have you collected the best practice or what organizations are doing to actually live these new values? Uh, that's a very interesting way. Of course, you could, and, and we are also thinking of making it possible to, do, to highlight those when you do a country values assessment of your organization. But the the doing is the key thing here. How do we behave? What are the examples? What are the stories to be told where you see the effect and the behaviors being acted out? Yeah, and if I may, Thor, it's exactly what we want to do in the next uh, e-dialogue, huh? because mm -hmm. it's it's we realize we were, we got the meaning of the words, but we ex four months later we have an experience on how to make it happen, mm -hmm. and we can actually identify what what works. Huh? We can learn from each other. We get this wisdom. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just was well, um, not a question, but a comment that's come in from Richard, uh, Richard Barrett. So welcome Richard to the call. And he was really Hi. responding to uh, what we were just talking about, about the, like the second wave and the, the new level of crisis, if you like. His comment was, uh, yes, they have a different worldview, world view, but when it comes to survival, you need a crisis director at level one. So uh, level one in the seven levels, of course, and that's completely consistent that when, uh, when the life conditions change, we need to respond at the level of consciousness that, that is necessary for that level. So thank you for that reminder, and Richard. If I build upon that connecting to the heroic uh, message that we have uh, displayed is that we respond to that in a different way with more caring more humanity more courageously taking a path where we invite people to be part of and uh, uh, so it's really def redefining that but it's really courage and standing up for what you believe in but also inviting and, and, and including people in the journey is extremely important and i think that's one of the key messages in in the heroic approach mm -hmm. yeah. And we knew at the beginning that, as John said, we were entering something that nobody had been in before. And so um, th this was about also having the vulnerability, the humility to say, you know what, I don't know the answer right now. And, okay. and, I, and I need the whole team around that, that we're, we're going to work on this together and figure it out together. I, if I may think, Phil, there's one word that you both have been using a lot, Thor and Phil, is the word together. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if there's out of all this heroic, it's all about being aware that we're together and that we have to make it together. And that word is actually, I think, key for every of the single six uh, enablers in the heroic model. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and Richard is writing that a true hero operates from a full spectrum of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I also have to say that we are totally blessed with questions. We have far more questions coming in than, than we are going to be able to handle in this call. So we'll do our best. We'll, we'll see how many we get through. But if we don't get through them all, we, then we'll do our normal thing of we'll circulate them and we'll, we'll provide written responses as best we can. 
again, yeah. not being the experts. There is also some good suggestions. Uh, Nick Foster is saying, is there a way to look at the previous aggre aggregated uh, Barrett re reports to see how how heroic we were in the 90s, uh, the 2000 year and the 10, 2010, et cetera? Is there a trend towards values identifying the heroic? Question mark. Okay. Interesting suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's go back to the questions. Um, so there, there was one on. Now I need to catch my breath. Yeah. I'm do, you, do, do you have the, one ready? There is one on the relationship of these values to organizational performance. Uh, it's too early to have any. Uh, reaction on that, but the only thing that came through in the discussion that was um, organizational survival, organizational reb rebounding capacity. So there is somewhere a value. It was all driven by organizations like being getting stronger or avoiding to become too weak. So in that sense, there is a link to performance, but not to a bottom line performance in the classical way. That's not being measured, and that's not can cannot be established now no and we haven't measured that as part of this we're, we're probably too early in that but we have over many years over many surveys we've measured the connection between healthy leadership healthy culture and what that does to performance of organizations including their financial performance and so as a as a general principle i know that the the more conscious the leaders become, the healthier the culture becomes, the more successful they become, and that impacts finance as well. And we, while we haven't done that directly in here, I would bet my mortgage that the same principle applies. What's different, though, is that we're working in, uh, in very different external conditions. So so we have we have leadership and culture, which is the internal part, and then of course there's the force of the external, which is the market and the pandemic itself, which which will create new levels of challenge. Yeah, maybe Phil, the, the what I think is, uh, it's transformation capacity and rebounding capacity more than performance, which is the focus now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In the discussion, at least. Phil Badley is actually asking a question which is kind of interesting in this perspective as well. Do you think that this need uh, for safety is also true for politi political leaders who are struggling to cope well? Yeah. And I think we, what's, what's your answer to that? So tell me the question again. Do you think that this need for safety is also true for political leaders who are struggling to cope well? So I'm a little thrown by the word safety in there. Um, and are you talking about, are we talking about safety in, in as much as creating safety for citizens or personal safety, like the risk of being a politician within these conditions? Because both of those situations uh, are true. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I think, again, we're I'm certainly seeing, I'm looking a lot of how different nations are responding and how they're responding is often a reflection of the leadership. And um, I gave you an example, again, not being perfect, but a leader who I think is standing up and doing a good job, Jacinda Ardern in, in uh, New Zealand at the moment, who's just been voted back in again with a landslide majority. And I think largely that's due to the, the, her, the consciousness and uh, her ability to lead in what I would say is a heroic style. And there are wonderful examples of leaders who are in a less than heroic style who are having a devastating impact on their nations as well. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the word safe, where the word, where the focus of the word safety is on that, but, but these principles absolutely apply at, at an organizational level and at a societal level as well. For sure. And, and it, it, yeah. yeah. You mean the heroic uh, um, dimension? There, there, there are some uh, some answers to, to to that because you know to be role model, exemplarity, give meaning, um, listen to people, behave like with a lot of empathy, uh, accept to be vulnerable, accept to to say, look, I, I don't know. You know all these heroic dimension. Uh, they, they they are for political uh, uh, people as well, whether they're men or, or women, um, and and this can help. Um, no. And I, I think on a certain level, the, the ability to say, I screwed up, we're going to well. change the way yeah. we're, we're doing things now. 
which seems to be a little bit absent uh, in some of the political leaders. Mm. But what I see in the, in the questions and comments, there, there is a will as well of a participant to share uh, best practices of countries. If you look here, there is um, uh, Ladislav who is sharing experiences in Slovakia. The whole nation is going to, to, to go through COVID-19 uh, tests. So I have the feeling that people um, would like to express maybe more things about, you know, the situation from a national point of view. And uh, this is what I take in the, in the comments and question that mm -hmm. we, we live in different world um, with different levels, um, different de decision. Um, but then it's also good to know that we have the capability and the possibility to uh, capture the collective wisdom of a big group of people who are actually quite yeah. dispersed in the world and doesn't have to come together in the physical room in order to, to get yeah. that uh, surface. Yeah. So that's also a message in, in how in what we would like to get across here, that you have that cap capability, that possibility, so to speak. And if you want to experience that, you have that. And I'm going to share my screen again because I'd like to start to round up uh, a little bit uh, more, which is more of... Um, saying what is going to happen in order to be able to finish in time. You will have uh, these links and, and I know that um, it has been, uh, Daniel has been posting these links in the chat box and you can do that again if possible. You can download the whole report and start to read and, and digest because that's a starting, getting conscious about what is the, what's being called for uh, coming out of this research or this uh, dialogue that we have had. And uh, also what are the different type of tools that you can have for leadership, but also then the invitation to continue this conversation and, and learn from that. Uh, that's the, the three different options for going from here, so to speak. And uh, we would like to uh, share a big thank you because this is not something that we have done. This is something that has been done collectively with a, a huge number of people from the whole world. Uh, and, and thank you very much for giving your time and energy and commitment and passion to make this happen. This is an, a very, very interesting stage and also possibility for us in, in our lives today. So um, I don't know if you would like to have a, a few single words, each one of you, and then, and then we could close. Well, for me, it was a, a beautiful adventure, and I thank you really deeply, uh, Tor, Phil, Anne, and Joanne, and Jean. Uh, it's been a lot of emotion uh, for, for me, and I, I loved that journey, really. Thank you for that. We had some difficult times as well, you know, like a lot of people uh, here today, and thank you so much for that, really. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for everyone who joined us and uh, hope to see you in the future in events, creating and the world together. Yeah, take care and look after take yourself, care. all of you. Yeah, thank see you very much.